Welcome to the NTEB Radio Bible Study with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday night edition of Rightly Dividing. My name is Jeff Greider. I am the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight, for the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight's topic is part two of understanding all of the judgments in the book of Revelation. If you were with us on Sunday night, we covered all of the seal judgments, and we cross-referenced uh, all over the place. We were in Matthew and Mark and Luke and Isaiah and Zephaniah and Zechariah and Amos. We were bouncing all over the place, and um, it was a great time in God's Word. And tonight is part two, and we're going to be focusing on the trumpet judgments. And uh, there's seven of those. There's seven seal judgments. There's seven bowl judgments. And uh, triple seven is what we have. And that's why we talk about the pre-tribulation rapture as being flight 777. If you're a gambler, and I hope you're not, and I don't advise that you gamble, but in the gambling world, triple seven has, <laughs> they love to get those triple sevens. And why? Because in the Bible, uh, seven is the number of God's completeness. And when something is three times, uh, God does everything in threes. And, and seven shows that what he's done in threes is now complete. So tonight, we're going to be looking at the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing on tonight's program. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all these that you're gathering uh, around the world, Lord, across America. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for every soul that will be listening live tonight and for all the souls that will hear it uh, in in the archives and on YouTube and wherever else that these programs are uh, posted and shared. We just pray, Father God, that your word would go forward in spirit and in truth and that people would be saved and saved people would be uh, instructed in your word. And we thank you, God, that you've, um, that you've done all this, that you've done, you've created the, the new NTEB podcasting studios that we're broadcasting live from right now. And, um, Lord, you've created the, the King James Bible and track program for people who can't afford it. And they're going out all over the world, Father, and, and the gospel toolkits and the gospel tracks. And you're just doing it all, Lord, and you're getting something done. And you've assembled us, Lord, as your eyes and ears in the end times. And we thank you for that, God, and we praise you for that. And uh, we are reminded and Lord, you, you you have brought this, it's it's not scripture, but you have brought this to my mind all day long today. The time in the 1800s when D.L. Moody was listening to a bunch of preachers talk, and he heard Henry Varley say that the world has yet to see what God can do in and with and through and by the man who is wholly consecrated to him. And uh, D.L. Moody said to himself that he aimed to be that man. And that's my prayer for myself tonight, Lord. And it's my prayer for everybody, uh, man, woman, and child who's listening to this broadcast, that we would want to be that person um, that the world has yet to see what God can do through us. And uh, Lord, in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, you asked a semi-rhetorical question. You got Isaiah's attention, and you said, Father God, after you had taken away his reproach, and he realized that he was a man of unclean lips, and he dwelt in the midst of an unclean people. And, and how did Isaiah know that? He said in Isaiah 6, 5, For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And in verse 8, it's recorded, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And Lord, that's my prayer tonight for everybody who's listening, that they would want to be that person when you ask, 
Who will go for us and whom shall I send? Let every single one of us, Lord, raise our hands and say, Here am I. Send me. And that's my prayer, Lord, for these Bible studies, that uh, the remnant church would catch fire in these last days and we get something done for you, Lord, and go out swinging. Uh, I don't want to go out meek and gentle and mild with my mouth shut. I want to go out on fire and swinging for you, Lord, and getting something done. And that's my prayer, Lord, tonight. And we thank you and we praise you and we ask you to meet with us tonight, Father God. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm really glad to see the chat room filling up nicely and rapidly. It's great to see all these familiar faces um, and some new people. And we love getting new people here. And uh, busy, 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 crazy, busy day today. Um, If you are curious, a lot of people have been asking me, uh, a lot of people have bought the uh, gospel toolkits, and a lot of people have begun to ask me, when might these things arrive at their door in the mail? And I just want to let everybody know that uh, they started shipping out today. So the gospel toolkits are going out, and I am sending them out in the order in which I receive the orders. So if you were the very first person to order, uh, you will be the first person to get a box, and so on and so forth. But rest assured that they, that they have started to go out today, and um, within, I would say, no more than the next five or six days— All of the orders will have been shipped out, and um, I really hope and I really pray that when you get these toolkits and the tracks and the Bibles and the Ruckman Bible um, and, of course, the John 316 KJB face mask, it is is really my hope and prayer that uh, you will really use this as a toolkit, a, a gospel toolkit and uh, that you'll get on fire for the Lord, and uh, you'll start handing out tracts and witnessing and leading lost souls to Jesus Christ, which is why he left us here. That's why we're still here. And um, so there we are. Welcome to the show.
to cross that river to where my faith shall end inside there's just a few just a few more days more days to labor just a few more days day and night Sweet Beulah Land, and that's what we're waiting for, and that's what we're looking for. And in the meantime, the headlines are growing darker and bleaker by the day. Uh, Here's just some random headlines for you. USA nears peak level of hospitalizations. Uh, Texas struggling. Rooms look like war zones. We are on the verge of lockdown 2.0. 300,000 COVID deaths by year end. One in every 98 Californians infected. And on and on it goes. More than half of all businesses that closed due to COVID-19 will not be reopening. $1,000 fine for not wearing a mask in Washington, D.C. Mandatory mask wearing in uh, city after city all across America. And it just gets worse and worse every single day. And Estevic just said there's a lot of fake news in the narrative. And that's absolutely true. But it's getting tougher and tougher to tell the fake news from the real news. And um, uh, as we get closer to the election, things are going to get really, really bad. So I want to start prepping and preparing everybody for a really rough couple of months Uh, As we get closer to the time when we're going to vote here in America for our next president, um, it's going to be a really wild, crazy, bad time. So whatever you have to do to prepare for that time, now's the time to start thinking about that. And whatever you feel that you need to do, whether you want to stock uh, food or water or supplies or vitamins or or (laughs) guns or Whatever it is that when you pray and say, God, what would you have me to do in these coming days, weeks, and months? And really earnestly seek his will for you. I've done that, and I know what his will for me is in the coming months. And by his grace, I'm going to do it each and every day. 
And I want you guys to start thinking about that now as well. And of course, um, sometime around November or December, maybe even as late as January, we're, we are going to have to face the vaccine question. And again, I can't tell you what to do. That's a very personal matter that has to do with your health and your body. Um, but I have made my own decision. I will not be taking any vaccine connected with the flu shot or the COVID shot or coronavirus or Bill Gates or whatever it happens to be. I am 100% at peace with that. And I'm not going to be taking any vaccines. I will not be carrying any type of digital uh, immunity passport. I'll wear the mask because on the front of my mask, it says John 316. And I'm looking at that as a really good time and opportunity to witness to lost people and to encourage the believers. But that's as far as I go. No vaccine for me. And no digital identification for me. But look, I don't say this flippantly, and I'm not telling you what to do. But please pray about it and see what God would have you to do. I've prayed about it. And God has told me in no uncertain terms what he wants me to do. And he's put me here in this new uh, Mudflower Now the End Begins creative studio. And uh, this, as far as I'm concerned, for me personally, this is where he wa this is my bunker. And uh, you have to decide where your bunker is going to be. But it's not a bunker in which we're hiding from people. It's a bunker from which um, we are prepared to make a, a bold, bold end time stand for Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about hiding in the basement and running away or going to some mountaintop somewhere like a monk. I'm talking about the war is real, the battle hot, and the time is short to the fight. That's what we say here, and that's what I want you to pray about, your participation on the front lines in this fight.
Amen. And that's where heaven is. The Bible says that heaven is up on the sides of the north, straight over your head. But you know what? Every time that I think about heaven, I always have a sneaking suspicious suspicion that while it is way out in outer space, and it certainly is up, because in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus went back to heaven, he went up into the clouds. But the more I study how God created this world, I just get a sneaking suspicion that heaven is a lot closer than we think it is. And um, I think I think it's a uh, dimension that is very close to us. And um, we, I guess we'll just have to wait until we get there to see what it's actually all about. But, but, but that's just the feeling that I get. I think that heaven is certainly not a place that you get to through space travel or rocket travel. And when Jesus went back to heaven, he disappeared at the cloud level. So I don't know. It's just, it's just the way I look at things. In my opinion, I think heaven is a lot closer than we think it is. And, well, we're going to find out one day, that's for sure. If you're just tuning in, in just a few minutes, we're going to get started tonight looking at all the tr- the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. Last week, we covered all the seals, and um, uh, we are going to cover the trumpet judgments tonight. And we're going to look at the 144,000 and see who those men are. Uh, Revelation says that they are male Jewish virgins from the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. If you're not a male, you can't be 144,000. If you're not a virgin, you can't be one of the 144,000. And if you're not Jewish from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, you cannot be one of the 144,000. And that is just the requirements. And that's what the book of Revelation, uh, in Revelation 14, that's what we read, that they are male Jewish virgins. Yes, that middle man made it possible. 
That middleman. Have you ever stopped to think about those two thieves? We call them thieves, but the Bible calls them malefactors. And we read about these malefactors in Luke chapter 23. But have you ever stopped to think about what those two malefactors did to Jesus Christ? They mocked him. They belittled him. And the Bible says that they both spit on him in the beginning. And as they began to watch Jesus on the cross, a man that they acknowledged, well, at least one of them did, a man that they acknowledged was innocent, but in the same condition as they were. And then one of those malefactors got to thinking. After he had called Jesus every name in the book and spit in his face, Now, of course, Jesus had his hands nailed to the cross. There's nothing he could do. If somebody spit in his face, all he had to do was take it. And that spittle was dripping down off of the face of the person who was on the cross to save his soul. And that malefactor got looking at Jesus and got thinking about Jesus. And Jesus didn't say anything. He didn't. He didn't. He probably just looked at him with pity in his eyes. And then that one malefactor got to thinking. He got to thinking, maybe, maybe this is the real guy. And in Luke 23, starting in verse 40, he says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now that's love, that's mercy, that's judgment, that's wrath, that's forgiveness. That's restoration, all rolled up into one person. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is, is God in human form. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. They are separate. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are equal. They are separate, and yet they are all combined in in one person, Jesus Christ. And that's why we preach and we teach Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if he be lifted up, he's going to draw all men unto himself. How do you witness? You tell people about Jesus. It's really easy. It's not hard to do at all. If you're saved and only saved people can witness for the Lord, but if you're saved, all you have to do is just tell people what Jesus did for you. Do you have a testimony? All you have to do is tell it. The Holy Spirit, he's the one that does all the convicting. And you're not talking about you. You're talking about Jesus. It's really not hard to do at all. And you know what? This this old world, this old world is hungry for Jesus Christ. Don't think for a second that everybody has been witnessed to and all this Christian radio and Christian TV and Christian billboards and bookstores and Chick-fil-A and all uh, forget all that stuff. There is a whole world left to witness to. And that's what God left us here to do, to look a lost person in the eye with the same love and compassion that Jesus Christ had on the cross for the malefactors who were spitting in his face and to tell them the old, old story. Can you do that? I know you can. It's not hard. That's what we're here to do. One day, Jesus is coming. 
You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time and ask for your blessing on this show. Bring to my mind everything you want me to talk about. Uh, let me forget the stuff that you don't want me to talk about, Lord. And I pray for every soul who's going to be listening to this program, whether it's live right now or later on in the archives or YouTube. I pray, Lord, that there, if there was one who was lost, who was listening, that something will be said and done that would lead them to want to be saved, Lord, and to ask how they can be saved. Acts 16, verses 30 and 31, uh, when that Philippian jailer came, came into Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And, uh, Lord, we want this to be a place where people continue to get saved. That, that's what we're here for, Lord, uh, to lead the lost to you and to build up the body of Christ and to prepare them to prepare us for what's coming next. And we just commit this time to you, Father God. We're thankful for it. We praise you. Uh, and, and, of course, we do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Welcome, 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 everybody. Turn to Revelation chapter 7, and uh, we have a fair amount of questions tonight, which I love questions. And um, the first question comes from Angel. Can the 144,000 witnesses come from all over the earth so then they can go out from where they live, or are they all living in Israel? That's a really, really good question. Turn to Revelation chapter 7, and let's see if we can answer Angel's question tonight. Revelation chapter 7 is where we first hear about this very interesting group of young men called the 144,000. And let's read uh, the first four verses of Revelation 7, verses 1 through 4. Revelation 7, 1 through 4. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So angels question, where are the hundred and forty-four thousand going to come from? Uh, my guess because the Bible doesn't say where they come from, but it is, it is clear that Revelation 7 says that they are sealed 12,000 from the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. Now, turn to Revelation chapter 14, and let's get a little bit of amplification on the character of these 144,000. We call them the witnesses. Revelation 14 
verses 3 and 4, uh, 5. Revelation 14, 3 through 5. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, whenever I think about an angel's question was, is where do these 144,000 male Jewish virgins come from? And that is something that has puzzled me for a great many years. And let me tell you why. It puzzles me because we live in a day and age where young men and women don't stay as virgins for a very long period of time. So if you were to go to any nation right now, I mean Israel, uh, Egypt, America, England, Spain, Germany, France, China, anywhere, you would be kind of hard-pressed to find 144,000 male virgins from any race of people, from any country. Uh, that's, I mean, unless you were talking about 10-year-old children. But if you, I mean, obviously the 144,000 are not 10-year-old children. Um, in my mind, I always think of them as being in their early 20s and uh, maybe mid-20s. So how would it be possible in the day and age that we live in to find that many male virgins, and when you talk about the nation of Israel, I think the global population of, of Jews around the world is about 15 and a half million people right now. So uh, where are you going to find 144,000 virgins, all men, from the nation of Israel? That would be pretty hard to do. So I think that the when God seals these hundred and forty four thousand, I I really, and the and the more I study it, the more I pray on it, uh, it really seems to me that there's a little bit of a supernatural element in where these young men come from, and I don't know. I mean, maybe if I have the time, I can really uh, flesh that out. But when he raises up these 144,000, um, I really think that there is some sort of a, uh, there's an X factor to this that nobody has come across yet uh, that would qualify such a large amount of young men to all be Jewish and all be virgins. And, but, you know, uh, I'm sure God <laughs> he has that all worked out. But you have to think about it from a very practical realistic perspective and these are real men and they're all going to be Jews and they're all going to be from the 12 tribes of Israel and God is going to mark them and they are going to be his soldiers if you will his elect and when Matthew chapter 24 talks about for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened Matthew is talking about the 144,000. And how do we know that they're going to go preach? We know that because of Mark chapter 16. Turn to Mark chapter 16. And this is the Great Commission. And um, we are not, we are not going to fulfill in the church age, we are not going to fulfill the Great Commission. And the main reason for that is, before you get mad, listen to what I'm about to say, is that in Mark chapter 16, we read what the Great Commission was and the signs that follow those people who carry the Great Commission out. Look in Mark chapter 16, and let's read um, 14 through 18. 
Mark chapter 16, 14 through 18. Um, And an angel is asking, are the 12 tribes from all over the world? They certainly could be. They certainly could be because there are Jewish people all over the world. They obviously have not all returned to Israel. Now, as we get closer and closer to the time of Jacob's trouble, rapture first, but as we get closer to the time of Jacob's trouble, more and more Jews are going to continue to go back to Israel. Um, but Mark chapter 16, 14 through 18 says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So stop right there for a second. Stop right there. Mark sixteen fourteen through 15, this is what we call the Great Commission. But the verses that follow this, well, you tell me if you can do this. Um, starting in verse 16, he will... 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, all of these signs will be done by the 144,000 in the time of Jacob's trouble and during the Great Tribulation. We obviously cannot perform all of those signs today. Charismatics try, and they die trying, to fulfill those signs. Uh, Down here, we live in the South, and every once in a while, I'll read about some backwoods Baptist preacher in uh, uh, Georgia or Alabama, and they bring out a snake, and they try to take up that snake, and they let it bite them, and what happens? They drop dead, and they die right in front of their congregation. That's what happens, because we don't have the signs of the apostles. We don't have this miracle power. You and I cannot take up serpents and expect to not die. You and I cannot drink poison and expect to not die. You and I cannot lay hands on the sick, as it says in the book of James, and everyone receive instantaneous healing. Um... We can't do that. It's not possible. So, obviously, Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 18, is not directed at Christians living in the church age. Because we can't do that. But it's going to be done. And the 144,000 are going to do it. Uh, The two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, They're going to do it. Uh, So that's how it's going to take place, and that's what's going to happen after the 144,000 are sealed. Remember, remember, the devil is the great counterfeit. The devil created the Roman Catholic Church, which looks and sounds a lot like the Christian Church until you get close to it, and then you realize that it's nothing like it. Um. Jesus says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that the very first sign of the end times is global deception. And that is the very, very first thing that Jesus, in all three of those Gospels, that he warns about. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul tells us will happen to all the world after the rapture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 8 through 12 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed. Capital W, it's the devil, it's the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy 
with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause, rejecting the gospel, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, that is called the strong delusion. We will not be here for that. This happens after the pre-tribulation rapture takes place. But this strong delusion is that Antichrist is Jesus Christ. And on Sunday night, we saw that in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, that's what the first seal is. Um, David says, when do I have the revealing of the Antichrist? Excellent question. I have it in the same place that the Apostle Paul has it. Look up um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and let's take a look at the first three verses of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, comma, and that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. Now, um, I was asked my thoughts on the timing of Antichrist. Paul just gave it to you in Second Thessalonians 2, 3. It's a three-step process. There's a falling away. That's step one. The man of sin be revealed. That's step two. The son of perdition. That's step three. So, we are living right now in the time of the falling away, where mainstream Christian churches are teaching fairy tales and lies and name it and claim it and get rich quick, um, and there's no Bible doctrine. That's what, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that's what the Apostle Paul told Timothy that would be one of the main signs of the end times. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come, this is our time, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned onto fables. Back to Second Thessalonians 2. It's a three-step process in verse 3. Uh, Let no man deceive you by any means, Paul says, for that day of the rapture shall not come except three things, a falling away first, the man of sin be revealed, and then he becomes the son of of perdition. We are living in the time of the falling away. Now, Paul says we will, that the Antichrist, the man of sin, will be revealed before we go. And then after we go, that's when he's going to get to work and get busy. But the Apostle Paul is crystal clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that the rapture will not happen A lot of people say, well, the rapture will happen when the last person gets saved. Well, that's true. At the rapture, you will have a last person getting saved. But I don't see anything in Scripture that tells me that that is what triggers the rapture. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 clearly says that there has to be a falling away first And then the man of sin has to be revealed before we go. Now, the Apostle Paul, um, Solis, has a question. In what way do I think he will be revealed? Like he's not just going to pop up and say, hey, I'm the Antichrist. Uh, David says, so how will us saints know it's him? 
Now, now we have some excellent questions. How will we recognize the Antichrist? Turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, please. Turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'm going to show you a biblical principle that will greatly help you in these type of things. Um, the book of Ecclesiastes, and I always, my eyes go, here it is, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The thing that has been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. Now we know. So the question is, how will we, as the body of Christ, recognize the Antichrist? Well, step one, you have to be saved and born again. The Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, and neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. If you want to know the signs of the end times, you got to be saved. Secondly, you have to be in the Word on a daily basis. If you want to know what's coming, you need to read the manual, you need to read the program. And the Bible, the King James Bible, and yes, we are one of those groups of people that preach and teach King James only. I do not personally believe that the NIV and the ESV and the ASV and the RSV and the message, um, I don't believe that those books are the perfect preserved Word of God. I think there's enough of the Word of God in the NIV or the ESV that somebody could get saved, absolutely. Uh, but I do not believe that those versions, if you want to know what's coming, if you want to know the real deal, um, you're not going to find that in the NIV, um, in the ESV, in the ASV, in the message, and all the rest of that junk. But I just put a link into the chat room for an article that I wrote called Seven Ways That Adolf Hitler Was a Perfect Type of the Coming Biblical Antichrist. When you have time, I want you to read that article, and I want you to think about the verses that we just read from Ecclesiastes, where God says, the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. And Adolf Hitler was a perfect type of Antichrist, and it's my opinion that Adolf Hitler was the last type of Antichrist. His Nazi party ID card said 555. The next one is going to be 666, and it's going to be the real deal. But when you study Adolf Hitler, and you study what he really did, what he really said, um, you will see that God was sending a message. Do you think it's an accident that mere months, six months after the end of World War II and Adolf Hitler committed suicide in his bunker? Uh, what does it say about the Antichrist in the book of Daniel? And he shall come to his end and none shall help him. That's exactly how Adolf Hitler died. And um, when you read what Adolf Hitler did, what he said, God is sending a message six months after Adolf Hitler committed suicide when he came to his end and there was no one there to help him. They created um, the United Nations in fulfillment of Zephaniah, where it talks about God gathering the nations for judgment. And then two and a half years after that, the nation of Israel was regathered. So how will we know the Antichrist? Because we know the Bible. Because we believe that when God says in Ecclesiastes, the thing which hath been is the thing which shall be. And we look at what's in front of us. 
you don't think that you're going to be able to recognize Antichrist? Now, when I look at what's in front of us, and I study, and I believe the word, and God opens it up, when I look at the world stage, you want to know what I see? I see this guy who is the man that I believe is the strongest contender for Antichrist, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. And I put a link into the chat room. Read that article when you have time. Um, and that's just my opinion. But that is what stands out to me when I compare what's happening to the Bible. Now, there's, um, there seems to be a little bit of a discussion in the chat room about reincarnation. Um, we do not believe in reincarnation. Uh, I don't even know why that's being discussed, and hopefully um, that discussion will come to an end. But no, there is no such thing as reincarnation. Um, that is uh, absolute New Age nonsense. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17 talking about the Antichrist. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Zechariah 11, verse 17. So um, that is what has to happen for the rapture to take place. The rapture has not been imminent for the last 2,000 years. That's another contemporary teaching that is simply not true. Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, say very, very clearly that there has to be a falling away first. Uh, Satman has a question. Do I think that the Apostle Paul started losing his gift of healing by way of 2 Timothy 4.20, where he talks about take a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thy often infirmities. Um, uh, it is obvious that the apostolic gifts that God gave to the apostles began to leave them. That is absolutely very true. And uh, that is something that the charismatic church tries to appropriate unsuccessfully. They cannot do it. And nobody has the apostolic signs because nobody is an apostle. You are not an apostle. I am not an apostle. Um, and when we have the rapture and the time of Jacob's trouble starts, what you're going to have is you're going to have tribulation saints you're going to have the 144,000 witnesses, and you're going to have the, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And they're not coming back because they're being reincarnated. They are coming back because it is in the Bible that they are to come back. And, and um, we have done many programs on the two witnesses, and maybe one day soon we'll do another program on the two witnesses. But with that, we have to take a quick break. Uh, don't go anywhere. We're just getting started. And when we come back, we're going to jump into the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. Stay with us.
And we're back for hour two of Rightly Dividing. If you're just tuning in, tonight's topic is part two of all the judgments in the book of Revelation. And uh, right before the break, we were talking about the 144,000 witnesses in Revelation chapter 7. And we're about to see what the seventh seal in Revelation chapter 8 is. Um, But just two quick questions before we get there. As Stevic wants to know, is... The rider on the white horse in Revelation chapter 6, is that Antichrist? Absolutely. Um, The Bible says that Jesus Christ in heaven has many crowns, but that rider on the white horse in Revelation chapter 6, he only has one crown. So he is pretending to be a king. He has a bow, but he has no arrows. Now, why doesn't he have any arrows because he comes in peace and he comes as antichrist and um so revelation chapter 6 that rider on the white horse that is not jesus christ that is the great counterfeit and everything that satan does is a counterfeit of the real thing. You remember um, back in, I think it's Isaiah chapter 28, uh, where uh, Lucifer is falling and uh, he shakes his fist to God and he has his five I wills. And he says, I will be like the most high. I will ascend up to the sides of the north. Uh, And then uh, he threatens God and he challenges God. And he says, I'm going to be just like you. And so when he comes, he comes as Jesus Christ, but he is a counterfeit. He is a faker. And I just put a link into the chat room called, if Satan is as great as he thinks he is, then why does he pretend to be Jesus in the time of Jacob's trouble? Have you ever wondered about that? Satan, the world's largest ego, and yet he can't come as himself. Because he knows that if he shows up as himself, the world will reject him. So he has to fool the world. But he can only do that when the church is removed and the earth for a short period of time is populated only by unsaved people. And uh, But that's just kind of funny that he thinks he's going to run everything. But yet he has to pretend to be the person that he despises the most. It's really kind of funny from a psychological perspective, if you think about it. Second question is from Johanna. Why do people call themselves apostles or prophets or prophetesses? Uh, Well, Johanna, the only thing that I can think of why people in our day, in the 21st century, would call themselves an apostle or a prophet or a prophetess. Uh, Those are people who desire to have a station that God has not given them. Because we see in the Bible very clearly uh, what prophets could actually do. And I don't see anybody in our day and age that can do what a biblical prophet could do. And then we see what the apostles could do. And um, the powers that God gave them, the spiritual gifts that God gave to the apostles. I don't see anybody anywhere on the face of this earth that has the signs of the apostle. And uh, people fake it. They fake it all day, every day, seven days a week. And there are thousands of churches with tens of millions of people worldwide who believe that there are apostles and prophets and prophetesses, but um, I haven't found them. I haven't seen them. I don't know anybody on the face of this earth that could walk into a hospital right now and lay hands on every sick person and have that person be instantaneously healed like the apostles could do. I don't see that happening today because it's not happening today. So um, I hope that answers your questions, Estevic and Johanna. And let's go on with tonight's topic, which is the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. So let's get back to, um, um, yes, the trumpet judgments, but let's get back to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. And if you remember from last time, uh, God gave us, 
the first six of the seven seals in Revelation chapter 6, and I showed you how they matched perfectly with Matthew chapter 24. And every single one of those first six seals matched perfectly with Matthew chapter 24. But then we get to the end of math of Revelation 6, but we've only gotten as far as the first six seals. And then in Revelation chapter 7, God kind of takes a break from the seals and introduces us in a parenthetical uh, manner. God introduces us to the 144,000 male virgin Jewish witnesses that he is going to seal and raise up. And God takes all of Revelation chapter 7 and shows us these amazing 144,000. Then you turn the page and get to Revelation chapter 8, and here we are, and what are we seeing? The seventh seal. So, um, God puts a space between seal number six and seal number seven. And one of the reasons why God appears to do this is let's look at what the seventh seal is. The seventh seal is it's a timeout. If you watch a car race like NASCAR and, um, after a car has gone around the track so many dozens of times, that car has to pull over and take a pit stop. And they, they, they fix whatever's wrong. They change the tires. They clean the windshield. They give the driver something to drink, whatever the case is. But in auto racing, especially when you're, uh, doing lots of laps at very high speed, uh, it is very, very necessary that that car pulls over and takes a pit stop. And that's exactly what's happening here in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So, the seventh seal is a pit stop. And for a very brief period of time, John says about the space of half an hour, 30 minutes, um, there's nothing. There's quiet. There's silence. But it is the calm before the storm, literally. And now we see um, in that space, in that sisura, in that in that opening that we see with this heavenly pit stop, verse 2 says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So, the seventh seal is actually fulfilling the first of the seven trumpets. The two are absolutely locked in together so that we go right from the end of the seals right into the trumpets. Verse 3 says, And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden throne which was before the altar. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So we see that the start of the trumpet judgments... Um, Jeanette just said, I think people in heaven are so much in awe of what's coming that they're speechless. Absolutely right. Uh, and all the host of heaven is watching what's about to happen. And remember, this is like the best part. We are up there with John, with the host of heaven, with the angels. So when Revelation 8 says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. 
and there is there is awe and there is speechlessness and there is silence in heaven we are part of that crowd that has been rendered speechless a lot of the times we kind of gloss over this chapter and we forget to include ourselves literally visibly physically in revelation chapter 8 the rapture happened in revelation chapter 4 the church is no longer on the face of the earth so we are part of this speechless group now you will notice that after the angels are given the seven trumpets, the very next thing that happens is the prayers of all the saints are being offered up to God. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayer of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Verse 5, And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, remember from Revelation chapter 6, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge our blood on those that dwell upon the earth? Um, And there's prayers being offered. And this entire what's about to happen with the trumpets, it starts with silence, and then it starts with the prayers of all the saints that are ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And then verse eight and the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound trumpet. Number one, the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And there were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burnt up and all green grass was burnt up and the second angel sounded verse 8 and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters which became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, are you starting to see when Mark chapter 16 tells us about the signs of the... um, It says that these signs shall follow them that believe they can drink any deadly thing and it will not hurt them. Do you see why Mark chapter 16 cannot be for the church age, but Mark chapter 16 will be fulfilled in this time period. Uh, Revelation eight eleven says, and the name of the star is called Wormwood and the third part of the waters became Wormwood and many Men died of the waters because they were made bitter. But the 144,000, they will be able to drink this water. No problem at all. And the people are going to see them drinking this poisoned wormwood water and not dying. Now, what does that sound like? Do you remember from, um, keep your finger in uh, Revelation 8. And turn to Acts chapter, I think it's 28. Acts chapter 28. And Paul, remember when Paul gets bit by the snake? Um, Acts 28, verses 3 through 5. 6. Acts 28, 3 through 6. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while, 
and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. (laughs) Now, obviously, Paul was not a god. This is a superstitious group of people who are thinking that Paul is a god. But why did Paul not die when he was bit by the snake? Because Paul had the signs of the apostle, and he could do miraculous things. Go back to Revelation chapter 8, and we see that these judgments, the trumpet judgments, are primarily a judgment on the earth. Now, remember, I think it's from, is it Romans chapter 8? Let's see if my memory is correct, or if I'm remembering something else. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Yep, here it is. Romans chapter 8. Let's start reading in verse 18. Romans chapter 8, 18 through 22. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirits, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Now, uh, Paul says, and he's reminding us, that the earth from Genesis chapter 3 is under a curse. God cursed man, God cursed woman, God cursed the earth, and God cursed the devil all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. So here, in Revelation 8, we see that God is judging the physical earth. And the first trumpet, what happens? Hail and fire mingled with blood were cast upon the earth, and it, and it burns up all the green grass, and the third part of the trees were burnt up. Um... Let me see if I can find that verse on green grass, because uh, in one of the Gospels, it is, they, yes, here it is. Turn to Mark chapter 6, verse 39, and I've, this, there has got to be a connection here. Mark chapter 6, this is the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, but look at verses 38 through 40. Mark chapter 6, 38 through 40. And he said unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they said, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Now there's only two places in the entire Bible where the expression green grass is used. In Mark six thirty nine, and Revelation eight, um, seven. Now, in Mark six thirty nine, the green grass is receiving thousands of people, five thousand people who are there to witness a miracle and to be fed from the hand of God, literally. Um, but here in Revelation eight seven, all the green grass the very same grass that received the 5,000 for the loaves and the fishes is now gone. So what does that tell you? What it tells me is that God is judging. Now there is going to be a famine upon the earth. Now, these judgments are literal. Um, It's talking about actual grass, and it's actually gone. But... It also points to the fact that God is judging the earth so that, um, uh, well, here, let me just pull up what I'm I'm about to say. Um, When you get into the time of Jacob's trouble after the rapture, 
one of the very first things that begins to happen is a famine begins to take place, but it is not a famine of food and water necessarily or primarily. The famine that takes place, now Solus just said, in my Bible it says green pastures. Well, <laughs> you need to get a King James Bible. Um, and right after the rapture, what's going to happen is a famine is going to be um, hitting the entire world, but it's going to be a famine of hearing the word of God. That's going to be the main famine that's going to take place right after the rapture. Uh, Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, tell us what this famine is going to be like. Amos 8, 11 through 13. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. Now back to Revelation chapter 8, um, verse 7, when that first angel sounds, and those, those burning hailstones mingled with blood, burns up all of the green grass, the same green grass from Mark 6, 39. So it's actual grass literally being burned up, but it's spiritually pointing to the fact that the famine that Amos is talking about is now in full swing. Second angel turns the water, um, a third part of the sea, into blood. And all the creatures that were in the sea, a third part of them died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. The third angel, um, there's a great star that falls from heaven, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And then a third part of the water become poison, they become bitter, and men die trying to drink it. Uh, Revelation 8.12 and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So, uh, turn to Joel chapter 2. Turn to Joel chapter 2. So, all of these trumpet judgments are physical judgments on the face of the earth. Uh, turn to the book of Joel, and let me see, uh, Joel chapter 2, uh, verses 28 through 32. Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, Romans 10:13, shall be delivered for in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord had said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, those things were taking place in Acts chapter 2, and then they stopped, because the kingdom age ended when they murdered Stephen. And then the church age started in Acts chapter 8. And we have been in the church age for 2,000 years. When the rapture takes place, church age is over, the church is gone, and then what Joel is talking about in Joel chapter 2 and what Revelation chapter 8 is talking about, these things will take place during the time of the Great Tribulation. This is not our time. 
And how do we know that? Well, there are churches that try again. They try to appropriate these signs and dream dreams and see visions and all that stuff. Now, does God occasionally give somebody a dream that turns out to be true? Absolutely. I myself, um, over the past four or five months, have experienced what I would con- I would consider um, a supernatural event or two or three. And God has been speaking to me very loudly and very plainly and very clearly. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. And, and um, I believe that this is happening because of the, of the time period that we live in. But it, it, it happens sporadically. It's not happening across the world. But the closer that we get to the time of Jacob's trouble, the more these things are going to increase. Satman says, is the verse on dreams and visions for us in the church age or in the time of Jacob's trouble? That is for the time of Jacob's trouble. Shari is asking, is this the time when men's hearts will fail them for fear? And I believe that is Revelation chapter 9, or let me see. Nope. Hold on. Let me see if I can find that before the break. Um, failing them for fear. Oh, okay. It's Luke 21, verse 26. Men's hearts, failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. That is the end of the great tribulation at the second coming. That's when those things will be taking place. But we are still in the church age and we are not the dispensation for signs, miracles, and wonders. And with that, we have to take a quick break. Uh, But when we come back, we are going to finish our look at the seven trumpet judgments from the book of Revelation, and we're going to have about a 10-minute prayer time. So if you have any prayer requests, please post them in the chat room. Lori will grab them for me, and uh, we will um, we will pray together as a church family. So don't go away. We still have 30 minutes. Well, <laughs> as Revelation uh, 8 says, we still have about the space of a half an hour left. So stay with us.
Monday, he's coming, oh glorious day, and you know what, that could be today, I hope you're ready. It could be today. It's my hope and prayer that it will be. All right, back to Revelation chapter 8, and we've got to finish up these seven trumpets. Revelation 8.13, we have just seen the first four of the seven trumpets, and what happened when the angels blew those trumpets. Third part of the trees, all the green grass, gone. Third part of the sea, gone. Third part of the creatures in the sea, gone. A third part of the ships, gone. And then the third angel sounds, and the third part of the rivers and the fountains of waters, gone. Water poisoned. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. You think God likes things in threes? I think he does. It's kind of funny that all these third parts of things are going on in seven trumpets. And uh, so all of those things happen with the fourth angel sounding the fourth trumpet. And then verse 13 of Revelation chapter 8. And I beheld and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And look at the end of that verse, yet to sound, one of the rare exclamation points in the Bible. Um, And so we have three more that are coming. The first four were absolutely deadly, um, but we have three more to go. Revelation 9, 1, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the smoke and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and there was given unto them power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, who are these men um, that don't have the seal of God in their foreheads? It's everybody except for the 144,000. So here, Revelation 9 4 references the 144,000 directly. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth nor any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So, everybody who's not one of the 144,000 who have been sealed in their foreheads by God personally, they are going to be stung by the scorpions. Um, I'm sorry, not scorpions, locusts. And that's what's going to be happening here. Now, this is not a sting unto death. Um, Actually, death is being withheld. And it's just all pain all the time. Uh, Revelation 9, 5. And it was And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So death, and we saw this in Revelation chapter six, death and hell are the fourth horsemen of the apocalypse. And here, death is actually fleeing away from men because God wants their judgment to be torment. And all through the Bible, and this is something that a lot of people struggle with, but God went to the cross to... Pay a debt that he did not owe because we have a debt that we can't pay. And Jesus wanted people to be saved so badly that he took upon himself in his own body 
our sins and our punishment and went to hell in our place so that whosoever shall believe in the name of the Lord should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, that's God's mercy. Actually, that's God's wrath because he poured his wrath upon his only begotten son. But if you reject that, the Bible clearly says that you will receive God's torment. And here in Revelation chapter 9, it says that when um, these men who were not sealed in their forehead by God when they are stung by these locusts that sting like a scorpion, God is specifically instructing death to flee from those people in order for them to be tormented. Now, think about that. That's the same God who loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to be crucified, died, and buried, and rise again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the same God. That's the same person. And in Luke chapter 16, what do we read? Luke 16, 24, the rich man's crying out. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Luke 16, 25, but Abraham said, son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus receiveth evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And go back to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, uh, verse 5, and it was, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they that, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. This is a picture of hell and it's on the earth and it's literal and it's actual. And this is maybe one of the most graphic illustrations of what you can expect. To me, what we're reading here in Revelation 9 is much more graphic than Luke chapter 16. And here we see that God is allowing these unsaved, unsealed men to be stung with these nasty creatures that come out of the bottomless pit. And he intentionally tells death to flee from them so that they can't die and end their torment. That's exactly what hell is. Hell is endless torment, and it it is from the hand of God. You know, the Bible says, uh, I think it's Joshua, um, is it 2415? Let's see how good my memory is. I always get nervous when I trust my memory about these things. Uh, no, here it is. Joshua twenty four fifteen. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye shall serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So here, back in Revelation chapter 9, We have people who are making choices and people who are making decisions. And in the time of the great tribulation, God is now actively judging the people who have been left behind. And this is why the Apostle Paul warns over and over and over and over, do not miss the rapture. Because when you miss the rapture, this is what is waiting for you. And it's bad. And it's nasty. Uh, Let's pick up the action in uh, Revelation 9-7. Revelation 9-7. And the shapes of the locust were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns of gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates 
as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and they had power, um, and their power was to hurt men for five months. Remember, we've told you many times that five in the Bible is one of those numbers that we see um, where things are dying, where there's a lot of death. You always see the number five. When Jesus was on the cross, he had five wounds um, that killed him. Uh, uh, all through the Bible, the number five uh it points to death. And here in Revelation chapter 9, it's this torment is happening for a five-month period. Revelation 9-11 says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. This is Antichrist. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, which had the trumpet. Um, no, and the sixth angel sounded, verse 13, And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, and were, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousands, and I heard the number of them. And I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone." By these three were the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold, in silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. So here we have here we have the seven trumpet judgments, and everything that I just read to you is literal. And these are going to be nasty creatures, and they're going to do nasty things. And all of these judgments that we just read about in, um, in Revelation with the trumpets, they are literal judgments. They're not military weapons. They're not Apache attack helicopters. They're not nuclear bombs. Everything that we just read in Revelation chapter 9 is exactly how it's going to take place, and it's exactly how it's going to be. Now, with that, we need to start our prayer time. We have a lot of prayer requests. Um, so uh, we will pick up the action, part three, Lord willing, this Sunday night on our um, Sunday night Bible study. We will do part three, and we're going to look at at the um, the bowl judgments. Some people call them the vile judgments, but the word vile does not appear in the King James Bible. Um, the King James Bible uh, calls it the bowl judgments. Um, and I take back what I just said about the word vile. I was having two thoughts in my head at the same time, but uh, suffice to say, we will be looking at the bowl vile judgments on Sunday night. Sometimes my thoughts just all jumbled together, so I retract that last statement. Now, um, let's go to prayer, and we have a ton of prayer requests, and I have a few as well, so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and um, let's get it quiet in the chat room 
and let's um, ask the Lord to do something for us. Heavenly Father, we come before to you and uh, we we just lift up your name, Lord. And I just said that we're here to ask you to do something for us, Lord. But um, our very existence is what you do for us, God. And we and we appreciate it and we're grateful and we're glad. And uh, we come before you, God, with full hearts because we have lost loved ones and we have sick family members and and um, uh, we just need you, God, to do something in our midst that we can see that's visible, that's tangible. Um, we're asking, Lord, specifically these prayer requests. Uh, most of them are prayers for salvation, which is wonderful, Father. Um, and we ask you to do these things for us, God, uh, and we ask you to show us, not because we don't believe, but because we do believe and we love to watch you work and we love to see you just do that which can only be done at your hand, God. So, Father God, uh, Mary has a prayer for her son, Kyle, and we pray for Kyle's salvation, Father God. Uh, GK is asking for prayers for an unsaved husband, Lulu's friend, Linda, uh, prayers for lost friends and family. Angela is praying for my son, uh, Matthias Anthony Serrata, to come back to Christ and for all of the lost sheep to return to Christ and that the Lord will take care of my sister, Deborah, until the time is right for us to be reunited. Kenny O says, pray for us in the California churches to be wise and bold in worship and service to Jesus. Now, uh, most of you know that in California, the governor, Gavin Newsom, has been shutting down churches. And I heard a story. I didn't have time to verify it, but I heard a story um, right before showtime tonight where uh, supposedly the governor of California is he has now said that you can't have home Bible study. So I don't know if that's true, but it certainly sounds something uh, like something that the state of California would do. But Kenny O is asking for prayers for the for the Christians in California churches for boldness and for wisdom and to get something done for the Lord. That's a good prayer. Regina says, my prayers are for my children and grandchildren to accept the free gift of salvation and those that have to have their eyes and ears open to hear the truth. Uh, Stephanie says, a prayer request for my father and siblings to also come back to the Lord. Rudana is asking, please pray for my husband and mother-in-law's salvation. Johanna has an unsaved brother. David says, please pray for my nine grandchildren who are under the age of 10 to come to the Lord. That's a great prayer. Uh, and I'm going to add to that. I'm going to add to the prayer list tonight. Um, while I was driving over here to the studio after church, I received a text message from a neighbor and... Um, they're asking, would I be willing to go to their friend's house? And her name is Lynn. And uh, she told me that she's seriously ill with Lyme disease for the last three weeks. She was in the hospital, but nothing has helped. And she's going to see a cardiologist on Monday, but she's in bad shape. Um, she was tested for COVID-19, but does not have it. So uh, my friend Lila is asking, would I be willing to go visit Lynn, who is seriously ill with Lyme disease? So we're going to pray for Lynn tonight and that God would give her a healing. Also today, I had an encounter with one of my neighbors here where the new studio is. His name is Ray, and uh, we had... We had a pretty interesting conversation. I don't know if Ray is saved or not, but we're going to pray for Ray's salvation. Um, Satman says, please pray for our daughter, Erica, and my wife's sister, Terry and Cindy. Trish is asking prayers for me to be bold as well and talk to people about salvation. These are great prayer requests. And uh, I... I firmly believe, 
with all my heart that not only is God going to answer these these prayers, but he has already been working and moving in a miraculous way. Don't forget, seven people have prayed to uh, to get saved in just the last two months. God is not just going to do something. We also need to praise him for everything that he has been doing. Um, Kimmy has a praise. Uh, praise to Jesus, my son Matthew accepted the Lord as his Savior, and we rejoice with that. And Kimmy, please feel free to post some of the details as to when he got saved and how he got saved. But we are rejoicing with you on that. Uh, Jade says, um, please pray for my aunt to not stop breathing in her sleep. And I guess she has some breathing, probably some sleep apnea that's happening there. We're going to pray for that. Um, and Kimmy, please post some of the details on how he got saved so we can all read about that and rejoice with you. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, we all have loved ones that need to be saved. And um, uh, we have children who have wandered away and, and uh, nephews and nieces and aunts and uncles and cousins who maybe had believed at one point, and they've wandered away. We ask you, Father God, to bring them back. Chrissy is saying, please pray for my niece and nephew who have gender identity problems. And uh, Lord, we ask you to do something for all of these prayer requests. Jason is saying, my 10-year-old granddaughter Paige greatly needs the Lord. 10 years old. She won't have anything to do with me because of my faith. And, uh, Lord, we ask you to, to, to heal there and to get something done. And, Father God, for all of us who are sick, like this woman with Lyme disease, and, uh, Lord, we have people battling cancer and heart issues and circulatory problems and stomach problems and brain problems, and we pray, Lord, that you would give a healing to us, Father God, and you would, would strengthen us, and, and not just a physical healing, Lord, a spiritual healing, that you would give us boldness during this late hour to witness and to preach and to teach your word, Lord. And, uh, Father God, I ask you to, to all of these prayer requests that we've mentioned and the unspoken prayers of our hearts, Father God, we know that you know, Lord. And we ask you, Father God, for all of these many prayer requests. Um, Shari says, pray for my four-year-old uh, grandson, Truman. He has um, pains and he's going blind. And Lori had asked me the other day, and let me see if I can quickly pull this up. But Lori had a request for her sister-in-law. I believe her name was Rita. And uh, we ask you, Father God, to help uh to help Rita, Father God, and uh, just to give her, you you uh, know what the need there is, and we ask you to do something, Lord, um, and help her and take care of her, and uh, Lori has needs as well, and we just pray, Father God, that you would meet with Lori and uh, grant the request of her hearts um, with whatever it is that she is reaching out to you for, Lord, for strength and for boldness and and um, for whatever she needs, Lord, but especially for her sister-in-law who is, who is sick right now. Um, Lassie says, please pray for my friend Shakira's daughter. She has active demons attacking her at age 15, and that's a scary thing. Um, Lori says, uh, please pray for my sister-in-law. She has been moved to the ICU and oxygen levels are as low as 70, fluctuating a lot. And then she says, uh, could I ask for prayers for Rita Kirby? Her son, Zach, um, uh, has been named POA and I'm praying. I don't know what POA stands for. It went right out of my head. Um, but, but, uh, Lord, we ask you to hear Lori's prayers, um, for her sister-in-law and for Rita Kirby and, um, give Lori the power to witness their Lord and whatever needs to be done for all these things. Father God, we just reach out to you as a church family 
And we ask you, Lord, to help and to heal. Give us what we need, Lord. Put the food on the table. Put the clothes on our back and put a roof over our head, Lord. And heal our bodies and heal our minds. And give us strength and boldness in these last days, in these final hours, Lord. That we would be found standing up for you, not running and hiding. But just as the firefighters and the policemen did in 9-11, they ran into the burning building, not away from it, Lord. And I pray that you would give us that same strength and power to do that for you in these last days. And with that, we've come to the end of tonight's program. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for all the great questions and for the prayer requests. And um, uh, God is... He's doing something, and he's doing something with each and every one of us. And I really hope and I pray that as we go further into the, this crazy year of 2020 and things begin to get really, really strange and weird, that we won't run, that we won't be afraid, that we won't hide, but we will be the ones on the front lines of the end times pointing people to Jesus Christ. Um, Lord willing, we'll see you right back here Sunday night at 9 p.m. for another Bible study. And before that, we'll see you Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time for another edition of the NTEB Prophecy News. Thank you so much for tuning in. Good night, everybody.